Can everyone hear me? Hi. So we're going we're gonna to get started with the next panel. So if everybody could slowly trickle in and come up and sit down. So my name is Samantha Hill, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the Hannah Arendt Center um, at Bard College. And I'm very um, honored and excited to be moderating what is sure to be an insightful and provocative panel this afternoon on how we talk about race. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers, um, and then we're going to proceed in the order that they're listed in your program. Erica Hunt, who is directly to my left, is a poet, essayist, author of Local History and Arcade, Peace Logic, Time Flies, Right Before the Eyes, and A Day and Its Approximants. Her poems and essays have appeared in Baum, Boundary 2, Brooklyn Rail, Conjunctions, the LA Review of Books, Poetics, Journal, Tripwire, to just name a few. With poet and scholar Don Lundy Martin, she is co-editor of an anthology of new writing by black women, Letters to the Future, which is forthcoming in 2017 from Core Press. She has received awards from the Foundation for Contemporary Art, the Fund for Poetry, and is a past fellow of Duke University, University of Cape Town Program in Public Policy, and is now the Parsons Family University Professor of Creative Writing in the MFA Program at Long Island University. Before assuming her, assuming her current post, Erica worked for more than 25 years in a social justice philanthropy, first as program officer at New World Foundation, and then later as the president of 21st Century Foundation, a leading public foundation dedicated to advancing black community change. And since she, she kind of gave me permission, I, I asked. Um, Roger cited uh, her beautiful piece on response to race and the poetic avant-garde in the Boston Review this morning. And, and she, she writes, I am was a New York poet. I am was an Antillian Afro-surrealist poet. I am was an activist poet. I am was a language poet. I am was a radical poet. I am was a jazz poet. I am was an essayist poet. Which I think is a better introduction than I can write. <laughs> Our next speaker is Chris LeBron, assistant professor of African American studies and philosophy at Yale. He is the author of The Color of Our Shame, Race and Justice in Our Time, and winner of the American Political Science Association First Book Prize in Political Theory, something I'm very jealous of. Um, I highly recommend this book. It is a beautiful and poetic meditation on shame and race and the social question in American politics. His second book, the Making of Black Lives, A Brief History of an Idea, is forthcoming from Oxford Unity Press in spring 2017. In addition to his scholarly articles on social justice and race, Chris has been active in public forums discussing race, social justice, and democratic ethics, and most recently uh, has written for the Boston Review and the New York Times. To my far left, is New York political commentator Deroy Murdoch. Deroy Murdoch is a Fox News contributor, a former media fellow with the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace at Stanford University, and a senior fellow with the Atlas Network, which supports and connects some 462 free market think tanks in the United States and 94 countries worldwide. His weekly column, this opinion just in, which I encourage everyone to go read, appears in the New York Post, the Washington Times, the Boston Herald, and many other newspapers across the country. Uh, he's a frequent guest on CNBC, CNN, C-SPAN, MSNBC, and many other uh, media outlets. Um, and I think he notes in his, in his bio that he hopes in a free society that we'll all have more time to eat good food, listen to live music, and spend time with our loved ones, which I, uh, I hope comes up in our conversation some point about democracy. Um, so without further ado, Erica Hunt.
Good afternoon. So, as uh, Samantha introduced me, I, I have to look at the ways that I've tried to blend a life as a writer and as a creative thinker and someone who works with language um, and works with a sense of commitment and social justice commitment. So, um, being a, a teacher of writing is a second career for me. Um, I started, uh, I, I tried to date when did I start as an activist and an organizer, and I have to say it's probably middle school. It seemed to me that given what I saw as inequity and experienced, though didn't necessarily have the name inequality, inequity, uh, injustice, it seemed to me it compelled a kind of activism and a kind of critical attention. Um, I went into, I backed into social justice philanthropy. I was working first as a radio uh, producer of a program on public policy and uh, the grants ran out. So I became a grant maker myself. And um, I realized I had entered into a space of uh, people of tremendous courage and hope. And by that I mean they dared to question, um, not from the safety of an urban New York neighborhood where everybody is a skeptic, but from uh, rural areas where really the only game in town were um, the people, the very same people who had been in power and entrenched for generations. So as a grant maker, I was, uh, I was blessed to be welcomed into um, small towns where people were fighting for better schools or for clean water or for um, the, really the right to vote post-1965, so Voting Rights Act, they were fighting for that. Um, often against local actors who were the descendants of the slaveholders, but were now the car dealers and the welfare office director and the, in other words, total control of people's lives. And in all of that, in the face of that, we're fighting the good fight. And I was the northern grant maker who came to be with them, understand their issues, and to try and get them the resources so they could succeed in the changes they wished to make. Later, um, I led a, a, a black foundation, the mission of which was to support black community change. We funded the first black men and boys initiatives, which assembled research, created the dialogue, and created the space for activists, policy makers, research people to uh, dialogue about how to create greater awareness of the school to prison pipeline, mass incarceration as problems that impact black communities. And we also led the funding to, we led the funding in New York City that came from New York City in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Um, in addition to what we leveraged, we made uh, $6 million in direct grants to organizations in Louisiana and Mississippi, working to bring people back home and deal with the environmental consequences and in the long run build black community power in order to gain greater accountability from local authorities and government. So I have had this, this life that has put me in sort of movement circles as well as academic circles, the classroom and outside of the classroom. And it's interesting to me these questions of real talk. Hmm. Okay. Oh, there we go. How can colleges and universities safe be safe, and inclusive, be safe and inclusive places for asking uncomfortable questions essential to our democracy, to your democracy, to our democracy. And it strikes me that those uncomfortable questions are often asked in communities and in movement building and in movement circles. There's a whole, I want to say that there's a whole repertoire of practices about dealing with difficult questions and, deal, and having difficult conversations. And how do you build um, not just for, you have to build uh, the, the will to move, the will to change in your own community by speaking to people who 
we all look alike or we all live together, but we don't all have the same opinion. And then you have to go outside the community and build coalitions in order to be successful. So these questions of difficult conversations, difficult questions, safe spaces and so forth are, are, are is, a, is, is a domain that is, uh, I think, well worked over by movement people. And I'm going to bring some of those, some of those practices to the fore. Um, It strikes me that when you ask the question about colleges and universities, it's interesting the way the discussion here has almost, uh, in some ways, done two things. One, detached what is happening inside a college classroom from what's happening outside the college classroom in the community at large. How can we divorce issues of power and privilege? How can we divorce issues of where you um, where, how you come to this, how do you come to be in the room, how do you come to be in the t at the table of, of discussion about difficult questions and conversations, and certainly that conditions um, how you hear free speech and how you hear uh, safe spaces and so forth. Um, I had a conversation, I was lucky to have a conversation with Desmond Tutu, um, and, uh, and in the course of the conversation was about Guantanamo and so forth, it was right after, you know, the, uh, really exposing, and I said, you know, and I said devil's advocate in a devil's advocate kind of way, I said, you know, imagine us as New Yorkers, we're so, it was 2000. I said, imagine us as New Yorkers, we're so psychologically devastated by what has happened to our downtown and, and you, you have to imagine the amount of grief we feel and, and so forth. And uh, so shouldn't we be afraid and shouldn't, don't we have a right to be safe? I was being a devil's advocate. I, I, I knew better than that. I was in front of an audience, it was in front of an audience. If everybody thought Guantanamo was wrong and of course, you know, I do too. But I wanted to poke a little bit at our consensus, assumed consensus. And he said, well, he went into a homily. <laughs> he said, but, but what I do remember is this. He said, there are no safe spaces. The world is not safe. And if we value our safety over the dignity of others, we will never be safe. Now, what he said, what he was saying by that is, in South Africa, he said, we had, to, we had to persuade a group of people to give up their ideas of safety so that others could have their dignity, so that others could have all the rights. I thought it was such a powerful thing because it, it, it said something about how those two things are linked. We can only have safety if we have respect for each other and if we hear each other, if we do the deep listening and the work. But safety is also relative. There is no safety in the world. Um, this is echoed in a James Baldwin quote that I picked up from his article, As Much Truth As One Can Bear. He says, the writer must remember, however powerful the many who would rather forget, that life is the only touchstone and that life is dangerous and that without joyful acceptance of this danger, there can never be any safety for anyone ever, anywhere. And then he goes on to say in that same article, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And from that, so if you think about that, for a minute, what I see there is that we have to be in a place where we have to be open to some risk and vulnerability. And that means that safety, again, is not quite the word we mean. We mean maybe respect. We mean maybe that our mutual equality is assured. These things, I notice everybody mentions it, it comes at people put it at the end, I think it's actually at the beginning, mutual respect, assumed equality of opinion, that we are learning together in a classroom or in an art space, that we are together in this. We have a stake in each other. Then we can assume some kind of space of safety to say difficult things, to have difficult conversations, courageous conversations. Uh, this is echoed in dozens of places by writers I admire, George Yancey, Bill Hooks, Sarah Schulman, whose new book, Conflict is Not Abuse, is very much in point and uh, aligned with this conference. 
Um, the classroom, George Yancey says, the classroom as the place where we practice loving wisdom and playing with danger. So I have this other theory of how we get to these difficult conversations. Why don't we consider it rehearsal? Why don't we consider it practice? Because we don't have those conversations. Our society doesn't open up such spaces. So in addition to, and I would say, in addition to the classroom where you set ground rules of mutual respect and relationship from the very onset, that maybe that's the space to start practicing having difficult conversations, conversations that deal with all the levels of oppression or bystanderism, oh, it doesn't have anything to do with me, or indifference or possible allyship. All of, those, all of those roles to be rehearsed, practiced in a classroom, or if not a classroom, because someone brought up that not everybody gets into a college classroom or a small liberal arts campus and so forth. Sometimes the college environment is a large university. Maybe it's an art space. Maybe it's a community space. And that's, again, where some of the movements, including Movement for Black Lives, has, you know, has really practiced some of these some of these conversations. Um, the classroom it can be a place to practice deep listening, not just listening to oneself or to ideas that are familiar. It is a place to practice as a team member taking responsibility for the learning and knowledge created with others. This is a Paulo Freire notion um, of Authentic education is carried on not by A for B or A about B, but by A with B. So that means that even the instructor is also in the position of learning. And that means giving up some power too. Might mean hearing something they may not have, never have heard before that is new to them and to be willing to change their minds and be surprised. Um, some notions about guidelines, comfort zone, learning edge, you probably know about this. The comfort zone is that place of uh, no challenge, nothing new, nothing to see here, different, this is different for different people, and this is racialized and has a sexual uh, edge to it. Sexual identity has a lot to do with the comfort zone, the comfort zone even of silence, that is sitting in a classroom and being passive and not saying anything, even though you have a different story to tell. The learning edge is usually anxious making. It's not a great place to be. Um, you have to develop and practice the tolerance for being stretched, for um, being annoyed or surprised or confused or defensive, to take in a new perspective. For some people, especially people of color, uh, letting white people get away with their discomfort, let, get, letting white people stay with their discomfort and not rescuing uh, them uh, by ending the conversation is a learning edge. For a long time, I used to rescue people. <laughs> I don't know, I, I didn't really mean that. No, I really mean that. <laughs> I really mean that. <laughs> uh, yeah. For white students, it may be learning to stop listening to the voices of authority and to acknowledge the need to listen more deeply. Where the learning edge exists for different people exists, and to be aware of this in the classroom and in the classroom, pra classroom practice. And to, again, it's about setting ground rules, um, the ground rules you could make up. Some useful guidelines, ground rules, you can add your own respect, listening, speak for yourself, use I statements. All of this is familiar, okay to disagree without being disagreeable. Be willing to change your mind. None of this is new, right? Triggers, you know about ouch and oops, right? The young people do. Make space for the process. That means if an ouch and oops is called to make space and to practice, practice, practice. Does anybody know what meshing is? Meshing is when somebody says something that is so incredibly offensive and rather than getting knocked down or knocked back to just sort of envision yourself as a screen door and the wind is pouring, just blowing through it. So it, rather than being staggered by it, you let it pass through. And then you do something, you, you center and you breathe and you clarify 
and you say what you want. And we don't get practice at that, do we? We let ourselves get knocked off our feet. So I want to uh, sort of move fast through this, which is uh, there's a technique called, that talks about reframing and narrative, narratives, new narratives. And uh, I'm just going to go through the typology really fast. So there are stock narratives. Those are the stereotypes that we have about each other, about why things are the way they are. Those stock narratives inc are celebrated in history and ritual and um, public, the law, the arts. It tells us what society sees as meaningful and important. Ideas like meritocracy, the American dream, colorblindness, these are stock stories. Then there's concealed stories. Concealed stories are told by people on the margin. What really happens? Well, I almost did this. This almost happened in our family. We had a chance to, uh, we own this land here, and then, um, you know, we, it, was, it was stolen from us. How many black people can say that about homes in the, and their traditional homes and lands in the South and black land loss? We used to own this land over here on South Carolina coast, all up and down, but it's gone now. Or, actually, yeah, we served, I served in the Great War. It was, it was hell, and it wasn't from the enemy. It was from my fellow, uh, my fellow uh, comrades in arms, comrades in arms. Concealed stories are stories that don't get told by the official narrative. You have to look for the concealed stories, and the concealed stories are important. Resistance stories, historical and contemporary stories that exemplify challenges to the racial status quo. We don't hear about that much. We have only like a few of those stories. We have the Martin Luther King. We have, um, you know, we have Rosa Parks, who, by the way, both practiced, practiced, practiced. Rosa Parks practiced at Highlander getting knocked out of her bus seat about what would she do when she was challenged. People practice their freedom. They practice what it is to live as a free person. And the resistance stories, we all actually have them. They have to be excavated. That is part of, I think, the job of art and culture and writing. Resistance narratives are also a critical thinking strategy, a way to strengthen our practice about ways to resist and work against racism or to act as an ally for justice. We don't get practice at that either. How do you decide when to step in to intervene, when enough is enough? Or you think, that's not right. Counter narratives. So there are four types, stock, concealed, resistance, and then counter narratives. Uh, counter narratives are, are also a form of critique and resistance. They help to create new narratives, a rereading or retreating of the archive. Um, there's a great novel right now, a series of short stories by John Keane, if you don't know, it's called Counter Narratives, in which he reimagines black people into scenes that are totally, in which people have been totally erased. So from the, from the founding, the discovery, uh, early days of Manhattan to, um, uh, the early days of Brazilian, the Brazilian colony, the Portuguese colony in Brazil. How do we imagine ourselves, people who are not written into history, to write oneself into history, into it? A deep act of imagination and creativity. So to amplify the silence, to use curiosity. Uh, counter stories, new narratives, and with Paulo Freire again, once named, the world in its turn reappears to namers as a problem and requires of them a new naming. So before I leave for now, I wanted to get us moving a little bit. I'm going to ask a series of questions of people in the room, and I just want you to raise your hand if it's true. Of you, so we know who's in the room. Who are you? Schools in my this is you're going to ask if it's true. You're going to raise your hand, okay? 
Schools in my community teach about my race and heritage and present it in positive ways throughout the year. Raise your hand. I wish we should have a counter. It's interesting how many people of color did or didn't. Students in my high school look mostly like me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> most, of, most of my teachers look like people of my race. I can make mistakes and not have people attribute my behavior to flaws in my racial group. Please look around. Okay. I can achieve or excel without being called a credit to my race. <laughs> my parents and grandparents could purchase housing in any neighborhood they could afford. Look around. My parents and almost all my relatives have attended college and were therefore ready to guide me when it was time to apply for college. Look around. Um, I'm going to shorten this. I can go shopping and be assured most of the time that I will not be followed or harassed. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right. I, I'm looking at my panelists here. <laughs> right. I never think twice about calling the police when trouble occurs. I am confident when I am stopped that I will be heard and given due respect as a citizen and given the benefit of the doubt. Look around. Um, stories in the mainstream media about people from my racial group are mostly told by people from other groups. Oh yeah, look around. <laughs> okay. um, I can take a job with an employer who believes in affirmative action without people thinking I got my job because of my race. Again, look around. And then finally, I know someone who has been arrested or incarcerated. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the question is, who has the right story or the right narrative? And we're fooling ourselves if we leave out power, race, sex, and status. Um, try telling the Karina, Katrina story without race and class or try telling, right, or telling the, your personal story without acknowledging race, class, the distortion, and the distortions will creep in. We don't face how race, class, and sex impact us, influence us, and what we think is a shield will wind us, will wound us, will wound us. So I'm going to end with, right now, to give time, um, with a quote from an article I just wrote about uh, James Baldwin. Um, and it strikes me that it's true also of the classroom. Art and writing, as, as well as a classroom, are sites to rehearse the open predicates of choice. And the work we do now, speculative and specific, demolishes the confining brackets of a zero-sum game, the presumptive culture of absolute winners and losers. You see, there is no line of demarcation, really, that separates us from another's pain is a paraphrase of what Baldwin wrote and would say to us again. I thank you. Sorry, I'm a pacer. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us and thank you to Roger and the team at the RN Center for convening us. I, I did toy with the idea of kind of con making my presentation concise by Trumpizing it, by saying something like, you know, many, 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 many people have had difficult conversations. <laughs> but some can't. Sad. So, we're here to about difficult conversations, so I want to begin by saying something difficult to you. Many of you, maybe most of you, really have no clue how racial inequality works in this country. Many of you have no clue 
how it feels to live in a country that is marked by racial inequality. This idea of difficult conversations is important because there's some actually problems with the very idea of difficult conversations. I'm a person who's trained in, in the use and analysis of ideas, so my presentation to you today will be a little bit different. I actually want to see if we could dig down to some of the questions that have arisen over the course of the panel. One of the first problems about the idea of a difficult conversation, especially in a setting like this, is that you and I are not having a conversation. As a matter of fact, most of the time when you're told something that you need to know or learn about race or sex or religion in this country, it's in a form like this or it's unilateral. You read about it. And that's not a conversation. And one of the problems with that is that a conversation is a kind of a dance, right? A conversation works with people learning how to step back and forth in unison. Just think about the times when you have a conversation with somebody and it goes awkwardly, right? You talk over each other, um, conversation shifts radically, the person's a narcissist when he or she is speaking, right? In this form like this, when I say something to you like, you really have no clue what racial equality is like in this country, there's nothing really left for you to do but to listen to me. And that's how, the most, that's how I suspect most of our conversations about the difficult questions works in this country. If that's right, and I think it is, then what it really means is that part of what we need to be speaking about is not really only how to have a difficult conversation, because usually that's not what's happening. Part of it is what it means for folks like yourselves to actually be consumers of the testimony folks like myself give, like people who have been up on stage give, is really to get you thinking about what it means to read an account of Erica's in Boston Review or of mine in New York Times or you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates in The Atlantic or in his memoir, and really figure out what that means for the person who wrote it, but what it means for you. I think one of the things we speak about in this country maybe a bit too much is the act of talking. And sometimes what's really required is really an act of silence. One of the things that gets me when I, you know, I'm in a profession in which the number of people of color at Yale, um, it's a very, 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 very small number. So I'm usually surrounded by really good meaning white liberals. And a lot of these people really do have very good intentions. But what gets me is that most of the time when you speak with folks, when you try to explain to them what it's like, right? You can raise a question about what it means to be not to be do what you do and not be a credit to your race, right? When you try to explain to folks what it's like to do what you do when you've won, let's say in my case, when you've won the book award, when you've won, when you've written for the New York Times, which are fantastic and privileged achievements, to actually still not be, be taken fully seriously. And then when you try to convey this, right, to interlocutors, they're usual next step is to try to find some ground from their perspective to meet you. And it always misfires, right? Because you say something like, look, when I was a junior scholar, for example, um, I once had a department, department chair curse me out and then joke about it. True story. And then you say this to one of your white colleagues and they go, oh my goodness, that is so unfortunate. And then they give some other story that really doesn't quite map on. They say something like, well, one time a person cut me off in a meeting and I really couldn't believe it. It was so rude. It's like, really? That's not... <laughs> it's, not it's not the same kind of a thing, right? And I, get, and I get the impetus to try and reach out. I get the impetus to try and find common ground. But often the, the attempt to find common ground is really not sincere. The attempt to find common ground is really an attempt to shield oneself from the hard work of admitting nothing like this has ever happened to you. It's really to shield yourself from the hard work of thinking, my goodness, there are people in this country who are genuinely disrespected just for waking up in the morning and going to work, right? For going shopping, for meeting a friend for having car trouble on the highway, right? And once that hard work is avoided, then no matter how many words we exchange, we are not having a conversation. And so part of the first thing I want to say is that this notion of having a conversation really needs to be modified and amended to the consumer part, right, to the listening part and the reflection part. We, do, we, talk, a lot, we talk a lot about talking, but we don't talk enough about what it means 
to reflect, what it means to prepare oneself to enter discursive practices so that when we are given certain various cues that should pique our ethical sensibilities, knowing when to speak, but also knowing when not to speak, right? Knowing how sympathy genuinely works, but also realizing the limits of one's own sympathy actually in an effort to actually build that sympathy out. Now, part of what's been getting at me listening to the panels today, including the president's remarks this morning, I wish you were here, because I don't like the idea of saying something about somebody who isn't present, um, but he had to walk out. What I find odd, and I applaud the three students who raised this point during the last panel, is this notion that offensive speech acts, or potentially offensive speech acts, or speech acts that challenge beliefs, are all created equal. And the reason why that's absolutely false is because positions from which we speak are not committed equal. There's this presumption that's been happening in the, this, this whole morning and during the afternoon in this room that all people who speak right, are on a level playing field of social power, and that is false. Let me give you an example. December 2014, I was giving a presentation at University of Pennsylvania, an Ivy League institution. And I must say, um, I've been very, very fortunate in my, in my career. I could tell you a story about how I got that fortune to surround me, but I'll just say I'm very fortunate in my career. Part of this program, I must give you a little bit of background, this was you know, a, a dean who invited scholars of color um, to the ed school to speak about race today. Now, this dean was a southern white man, and he was very, very proud of his program. You already know trouble's coming, right? He was very, very proud. He was very proud of his program. Now, this is happening alongside something else. Late 2014, you, me, the whole world watched a white cop choke a black man on a stand on the street and leave him dead in the street. You saw it? I saw it. There's nothing to debate about. He, po he choked a man who was not a physical or violent threat to him. The man died. We all saw it. So we're not going to have a debate about that. All right, so I give my, converse, my, my talk, and part of the talk, what I'm arguing for in this work that I was doing was the role of imagination, how imagination can help to, in some sense, right, have difficult conversations. My argument was that really, if we want to work on race in America, one of the key things that has to happen, that has to succeed, is that white Americans have to be able to imagine what it's like to be black in America. Okay. So I give my talk, we have question Q&A. Now one of the great things about doing these gigs is that they're very cushy. You get a nice dinner, I have to admit, it's pretty sweet. And so at the end of the evening, so early evening, I get to the hotel. I mean, I get to the restaurant. But something happened be between the end of my talk and going to dinner for the hotel. What was it? Daniel Pantaleo, who choked Eric Garner, was excavated. Just let him walk out the door. So, I'm on text with my friends because, you know, one of these things you have to think about is what does it mean to be in a country where a person could choke a person on YouTube like it's the purge and go home and have spaghetti at the end of the day. So I text my friends very emotionally, please take care of your son. This is not a safe country. I was completely distraught. Okay, so I go to the dinner anyway because I'm professional. So I'm expected at the dinner, so I go to the dinner. We're all sitting around. There's only one other black gentleman at the table. All, everybody else is white scholars. This is typical for the academy, especially at these prestigious institutions. And the southern dean, who's very proud of himself, was there as well. So we're talking, chatting, of course. The conversation comes back around to this talk I gave. And he says, there's something I can't wrap my mind around. And listen, whenever someone begins with, there's something I can't wrap my mind around, <laughs> ask for the check and go home. I wasn't paying, so I stayed. <laughs> Something I can't wrap my mind around. You think what I need to do is imagine what it's like to be a black person in America. Is that right? And he caught me at a bad time because I was already pretty pissed off. I had just seen this news about Eric Garner, and I really wasn't having it. So um, that's right. That's my argument. You have to be able to imagine what it's like to be a black man in America, black person in America. <laughs> Well, you think you know what it's like to be a white man? <laughs> yes, I'm sitting here with you, aren't I? 
jaw, ground, done. And I meant that very sincerely because to walk the halls that I walk, I can't do it thinking like where I grew up from. I have to amend it. I have to put it, put it through a filter. I have to, in some sense, modulate the lessons I've learned in life to make how I act, in some sense, coalesce with what whites expect of me. All right? And when we have a situation like this, all right, there is a question of safe spaces. Because when a man like this says, using Greg Lukianoff's examples, right, I believe everyone gets what they deserve based on fair opportunity. No, I know it's like to be a white man in America, and I know for a fact I didn't get what I deserve, what I have because only because I deserved it. I know that for a fact. And so when you say something like to me, I think you're full of it. And it makes me feel a little bit threatened. Now I'm pretty big guy. I'm also pretty hard-headed, maybe even a little bit arrogant, so these things don't stick to me as much. But nonetheless, the speech acts that we're sharing at that particular moment, they're not created the same. When he says something like, right, America is a melting pot, I'm thinking, no, it's not a melting pot. I just watched a white cop kill a black guy and go home and have spaghetti. What kind of melting pot is that? Right? In a real melting pot, the law applies equally to everybody, not to just some people. So when you tell me it's a melting pot, you're, you're describing one country to me, and I'm hearing another country. We're not sharing the same space. And i got to be honest, if that's what you think about America, I don't really feel that safe around you. Okay? So, which leads to the final point I want to make. The other thing that students are told today about these diff conversations is, and we heard, that from, we heard it from some early speakers, is don't be angry. I can't make sense of that. I don't know what that means. I, can't, I, don't know, I have no idea what that means. And here's one reason why. Here's one reason why I don't know what that means. And I'm speaking directly to the brown students in the room. You are the umpteenth generation in America to be told, be patient. You are the umpteenth generation in America and saying, why are you so angry? You are the umpteenth generation in America to watch black people get left on the street with no consequences. And now I ask you, why shouldn't you be angry? Now, I'm not saying that your anger should drive you. I'm not saying that you ought to be angry. What I am saying is that the language of being patient, the language of do not be angry, is almost always a socio-political tool to disrupt the motivation to agitate for what's yours by right. That is respect for your humanity. And, I don't, and if you want to talk about why people shouldn't be angry, you go and look at a Trump rally. There's some pissed off people and they have nothing in the world to be worried about. Except the threat to the entitlement that they know will one day come to an end if we don't give up the fight for our respect. But you can't fight for your respect just sitting by the sidelines acting as if the world operates fairly when you look on YouTube and it clearly does not act fairly. So my final point is my message to the young folks in the room. And that is, everyone wants to tell you how you need to comport yourself to each other in difficult situations. And the bottom line is, you know what you're doing, and you know what you're doing because the way that we respond to difficult moral situations emotionally is almost always based not on irrationality, but on reason and rationality. When students at Yale are completely taken aback by the housemaster saying it's okay for Halloween to wear, right, to be in blackface or some such, something like this, that rage that bubbles up is not just because, right, someone has said you can wear a certain kind of costume. The rage that bubbles up is indexed to knowledge of a history, which as James Baldwin always said, white Americans are always in a quick hurry to forget our history, but not black people. And we know that when somebody says, it's okay being blackface, no need to be politically correct, that's really just one way of saying, right, you are endorsing the idea of making a, a mockery, a historical mockery of an identity that is already burdened by 300 years of abuse and oppression. They're not upset by the costumes, they're upset by what that utterance means. And so when people tell you that you need to, in some sense, stop being coddled, you have no reason to listen to these people because part of your response is based, right, in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in what is motivated within you when people, in some sense, right, so we have trigger warnings there, in some sense, triggering 
your historical awareness of your position in society. Does that mean that everything in the world needs to be offensive or send you scuttling? I don't think that's what you're doing in any case, right? Because it is important that people be able to have difficult conversations. But I will say this, and I'll say it without qualification. Some things don't need to be talked about. And the one thing that does not need to be talked about is the idea of your own self-respect. And when you feel that threatened, there's no need for you to compromise on that. And once you realize that, then that's the end of that difficult conversation. Well, thank you very much. My name is DeRoy Murdoch, the final panelist up here today, or at least on this panel. I'd like to say thank you to Samantha Hill for the uh, introduction earlier and uh, to my panelists as well for their presentations. I want to say thank you to the Hannah Rent Center and to uh, Roger Berkowitz for the invitation to be here with you today. And thank you to, for all of you for being here and staying through uh, this far, this late in the uh, afternoon. I have a bit of a cold, so excuse me while I try to get through this uh, without too much pain in my throat. Uh, let's see a show of hands. Any Steely Dan fans in the audience? There are some Steely Dan fans in the audience, very much. Well, as some of you may or may not know, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan were students here at Bard College. They then went on to found uh, Steely Dan, one of the greatest rock and roll bands ever, of which I've been a very huge fan since I was a little boy. So this is my first time at Bard College, although musically I feel today that I am returning to my old school. So thank you again for that distinct pleasure. Uh, let me begin by uh, talking about uh, our former Attorney General, Eric Holder, who took office in uh, February of 2009 as uh, Attorney General under President Obama. And uh, his very first speech was in February of 2009, and he made instant headlines when he said that America is, quote, essentially a nation of cowards, unquote, uh, essentially because we refuse to engage in a national conversation on race. And that was quite an eye-opening comment, and I thought it was quite an interesting thing for him to say. Uh, number one, it's pretty unusual for uh, politicians or, or public leaders, public officials, to call other Americans cowards. You don't see that very often. Um, secondly, uh, Air Attorney General Holder said that Americans are not just cowards, but cowards specifically on race. And this was coming from America's first black attorney general, who was appointed by America's first black president, who got there, of course, after he was elected by a majority of American voters, and at the, shortly after he was sworn in, was enjoying a 70% approval rating right after he took office in January of 2009. And third part of it, I, I thought, was what the hell is Eric Holder talking about? America has refused to conduct a national conversation on race. What was he saying? Where, was, where has old Eric Holder been? America has engaged in a national conversation on race since approximately 1787. And that was when we had the debate over the three-fifths three compromise and the decision among those who craft, crafted our Constitution to count each slave as three-fifths of a human being. Now, is this insulting, degrading, and dehumanizing? Yes, yes, and yes. But that decision by the Constitutional Convention reduced the number of seats that the southern states would have in the U.S. House of Representatives, and this weakened overall the southern uh, states' political power as a bloc in Congress. So there was some good that came out of that very strange decision. So it went from the three-fifths compromise to abolitionism, the Underground Railroad, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, uh, around uh, the turn of the uh, 20th century assimilation and Americanization of immigrants, the Civil Rights Movement, forced busing, racial preferences, affirmative action, set-asides, voting rights, school choice, uh, divestment, and apartheid uh, in South Africa and then uh, the debate over gangster rap and rap music and whether these are things are forced for good or not. In other words, if Eric Holder uh, d uh, did not detect a national conversation on race in 2009 when he made that comment, he must have flunked American history class, failed current events, uh, or not picked up a newspaper or clicked on a television set in the, previous, in the years, 20 years previous to that remark that he made. Regardless of that uh, situation back then in 2009, Eric Holder should be very happy today, today because the national conversation on race is as relentless and all-encompassing as ever. And frankly, in my opinion, it is ubiquitous to a fault. We can and should have personal, local, and national dialogue, as we're having today and this afternoon, about how to understand each other, learn from each other, and build a better society together, whatever our racial and ethnic identities, and being aware of each other and those differences as well. But I think we've gone far, in fact, far too far beyond that level. 
Karl Marx authored the concept of economic determinism. And to oversimplify it a bit, this is basically the idea that to understand a society's economy is pretty much all that one needs to know to understand that society. Similarly, America in 2016 seems to be adopting a sort of racial determinism, that race is really all you need to know to examine, uh, need to examine in order to understand America today. Race is the primary, if not the only lens that we should employ to understand America and events in our country. And third and most troubling, a constant and universal focus on race and a presumption of boundless racism corrodes and ruptures the common bonds that hold together this highly pluralistic, multi-ethnic nation. All of this manifests itself in very strange, counterproductive, and ultimately destructive ways. I'd like to go through these now, through a few examples of this now. Uh, I saw on Monday a drinks with a young filmmaker uh, in New York City. He's a recent graduate of New York University's uh, film school, Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, he's white. He's Jewish, happens to be a young gay man. And he told me the frustration he felt when he was assigned in part of his film, uh, film classes to write scripts for movies that he wanted to do, short films. And uh, when he turned in one of these first few scripts, he was told by his colleagues and other people who were critiquing his work, why don't you have people of color in your scripts? They're all white. It's like looking at a Woody Allen picture, nothing but white people. So he was quite uh, chastened by that. So he then did his next script. He put in some uh, characters of color. Then came the comment right afterwards, who are you to write dialogue for black characters? What do you know about the black experience? What do you know about black people? Shame on you. And he just looked at me with a bewildered look, and he said, I'm damned if I do, and I'm damned if I don't. Now, does anyone here like pumpkin spice lattes? Raise your hands. There are a few fans of pumpkin spice lattes. Well, you might enjoy reading an article by Catherine Timpf, my uh, esteemed and, and very talented colleague at National Review Online. She wrote an article October 12, just a few days ago, and it's about pumpkin spice lattes, or PSLs, as she calls them for short. Uh, there's an article written by a woman named Lisa Jordan Powell, who is a professor at the University of British Columbia. She's a scholar there. And she wrote a, a study titled The Perilous Whiteness of Pumpkins. And quote, it examines the symbolic whiteness associated with pumpkins in the contemporary United States. And to quote uh, Professor uh, Jordan Powell, quote, although the PSL was celebrated as a company in cultural success in 2013, I believe by Starbucks, one year later it was firmly hitched to discussions of white female identity and consumerism as both a dismissive, racially coded slur and a rallying counterpoint. And she continues, PSLs are one step further from actual pumpkins. Their fluffiness, lack of substance, and triviality, regardless of attempts to dismiss them as basic, make them ultimate luxuries and hence markers of distinction and white privilege, unquote. So PSLs, next time you see a PSL at Starbucks, be sure and scream racism, sexism, etc. <laughs> now we're urged every day to celebrate diversity, and yet if you celebrate diversity, that is one of the fastest ways to get yourself into very big trouble. Uh, sometime last school year, some students at a university, I'm sorry, I forget which university, but in, in the U.S., uh, decided that they'd have some fun and hold themselves a tequila party. So they had tequila, they had tacos, etc., and a few of them wore sombreros. Well, all hell broke loose. Total chaos. Students at that university of Mexican descent rebelled. They screamed racism. The school brought in psychologists to sit down with the students of Mexican background, counsel them, and help them uh, get over their sense of, of, uh, of grievance and isolation. But what would happen if the same Hispanic students wore green shirts on St. Patrick's Day? Would that be anti-Irish bias? What if they wore berets at a Bastille Day celebra celebration? Would that be francophobia? How about if they wore kilts at a reading of poems, poems by Robert Burns? Would that reflect hatred of Scottish people and trivialization of Scottish culture? Or a sombrero is the only form of attire that generates such a response? And most important, where, oh, where are the university administrators who will say, grow up, it's just a hat. If you don't like it, skip the tequila party, go to the library, and do your homework. And by the way, if you find sombreros to be something you can't handle and you just are not able to stand up to something like that, just wait until you have to deal with something like an audit by the IRS, uh, dealing with your mother or father dying of cancer, uh, maybe in 15 or 20 years having your child die of some childhood illness or get hit by a car or have a relative die in war. Prepare yourselves now as college students for traumas that you will suffer down the road. They'll be much, much more difficult on you than looking at somebody who's not of a Hispanic background wearing a sombrero. <laughs> 
As former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg put it, microaggressions are just that, micro. We're told to celebrate diversity, but what I recently heard you are not supposed to do is ask people where they're from. If somebody has an unusual accent or some, something that leads you to think that person is not from this country, if you say, hey, where are you from, what kind of an accent am I, am I hearing, uh, that expresses bias and creates discomfort. But if I don't know that your accent means that you're from Turkey, how can I tell you that I have visited your country, had a lovely time there, and cannot wait to return? If I see that your name tag says, hi, my name is Titty Porn Pungestical, that is an actual name, how without asking will I know that it's a Thai name and that I have friends who live and work there, maybe even people that this person might happen to know. Perhaps we have mutual friends in common. So if we're not able to ask those questions, how do we find out those things about each other? No, we're told, keep things to yourself, don't ask, don't reach out, don't take that opportunity to start a dialogue. Much better clam up and walk away. Now how does that help build bridges or bring people together? We also have the issue of cultural appropriation. Some people lately have, have responded to this big boom of yoga we're seeing across the country, uh, all sorts of women and some men doing yoga. Uh, some people have said, well, how dare these white people and others practice yoga? It's something that was started in Asia. It should be enjoyed by Asians only. And if white folks engage in yoga, that is cultural appropriation. How dare they? Shame on them. Well, if that's the case, isn't this a two-way street? If it's cultural appropriation for white people to do yoga, is it also cultural appropriation for black actors to perform Shakespeare? What the hell does Denzel Washington or James Earl Jones know about being a 16th century Englishman? So let's leave Macbeth to the experts, white people with British roots. Remember, these are, should be two-way streets. If this universal truth is true in one direction, it should be true in the other direction. If you look at, look at it off in the other direction, it looks very often increasingly absurd and inappropriate. We also have the assumption of racism in so many areas, and so many topic, topics that come up. People hear what your view is, they think, oh, it must be because of racism. For example, the question of presenting photo identification at the polls. This is something a lot of us uh, have been concerned about, that there is a problem of vote fraud in this country, and that one way to fight it is for people to show ID cards and show that the person who is uh, listed on the vote registrar is actually the person standing in front of you and will vote on behalf of that person and not somebody else. Uh, vote fraud does happen. I think it's probably a fair comment to say that it does not happen as often as those on the right says it does, but I think it happens a lot more than people on the left say that it doesn't occur. For example, in 2000, uh, 2012, in Philadelphia, there were a number of precincts in which 100% of the voters voted for Obama and zero voted for Romney. Now, Mitt Romney got, and these are black, uh, primarily black precincts. Now, we're, Mitt Romney got about 6% of the black vote across the country. Not a big number, but he got 6% of the black vote. Yet he didn't get 6% of the black vote in these precincts in uh, Philadelphia, or four, or three, or one, or a couple. He got zero votes, including accidental votes. Maybe somebody wanted to vote for Obama, but accidentally pulled the wrong lever or filled in the wrong bubble. Zero votes. That seems very unusual to me. There have been people who have been, who have been convicted and, and actually before court of law found guilty of voting in more than one state. They're registered, for example, at home, at their mom and dad's house, they're in college or university, graduate school, whatever, and so they register wherever they're going to school and they vote in their school address, they vote in their home address back home, they vote twice, and uh, some people have gotten busted for that. So that's another example of this. Troy, New York, not that far from where we're sitting here today. I forget the exact number, but I think it was about 50, 60, 75 people were all registered at the same address. And somebody went to visit the location where all these people were registered. Well, guess what? It was a vacant lot. There wasn't a house there, no apartment, just a vacant parking lot. And all these people were registered there. So when they all went to show up and vote, these people were not tied to that address because they couldn't live there. And yet these people showed up and cast ballots. And yet if you say, look, one way to fight this problem is to have photo ID at the polls. It's attacked as an anti-black, racist, Republican plot because black people can't be expected to possess photo ID cards. Now, it's funny because uh, blacks are not considered too incapable of having photo ID cards when, we're, when we go to, the bank, uh, go to the bank and we're asked to cash checks. They say, show, you, show your ID card. When I go to the airport, nobody, nobody says to me, well, you're black and your family's gone through racism and slavery and so on, so just get on the plane. It's okay, don't bother. They ask me for an ID card every single solitary time without exception. Entering government buildings, you often have to show a photo ID card to get into a government building, including the Department of Justice. So now that Eric Holder is gone, if you want to go complain to Loretta, Loretta Lynch, our Attorney General, about uh, problems with voter ID or your inability to vote or whatever it may be, you can't go talk to the Attorney General of the United States without showing a photo ID card. I think that's a massive, massive irony. Uh, I live in Manhattan. 
New York City, this is from the New York City Department of Homeless Services, frequently asked questions. I just got this online last night. <clears throat> and it says here that the New York City Department of Homeless Services, where can New Yorkers apply for shelter? Before any, New York, any New Yorker can enter shelter, he or she must first apply at the intake center that is designated for his or her family composition. And it continues. What documents are required to apply? All families and individuals applying for shelter must have valid original identification, such as a welfare ID card, green card, driver's license, passport or visa, picture employment card. Then continues, uh, clients do not, who do not have a picture ID to prove their identities, documents that may generally be used include a birth certificate, social security card, Medicaid card, identity card in the public assistance system, or pay stub. So in New York City, not exactly the most right-wing place in America, under Mayor Bill de Blasio, who's not considered the most right-wing mayor in New York City, you've got to show photo ID or some very respected form of identification before you can enter a homeless shelter. And yet if you say you've got to show photo ID before you vote, somehow that is a racist plot. Uh, then we go on to the next topic. Let me have a sip of water here. Black Lives Matter. Now, Black Lives Matter, or the organization, correctly focuses on examples of out-of-control, trigger-happy, poorly trained, and perhaps even racist cops who shot and killed unarmed uh, black people, particularly more often than not unarmed black men. But not all unar unarmed black men who are shot uh, are shot by white cops. Black Lives Matter makes a lot less noise in cases where black men or unarmed black people are shot by black cops. Some black men who have been shot either were armed with guns or point things at cops that look like guns. For example, I think this was in San Diego, if I'm not mistaken, a few weeks ago. Uh, a black man recently stood in an assault posture like this, and the cops came upon him, and he was holding a metal object that looked like a gun. In fact, they shot him. They thought in that little bit of time they had to make a quick decision, they thought he was holding a gun. It turned out to be one of those uh, smoking toba uh, tobacco vapor pipes, but it had a black section about that big and then a piece of metal pipe sticking out like this. And when somebody's holding this at you like so, um, it's not surprising the cops might think, oh boy, that's a gun, and we got about an eighth of a second to bring this person down before he kills us. Um, you, that might be racism. I think it was actually an un unfortunate, very trag tragic situation, and one that would have been avoided had this gentleman not been pointing that metal object at the police. USA Today, I believe it was, looked at fatal shootings of blacks in America between 2008 and 2013, and they found that approximately 100 people per year are involved in uh, police, or are, are killed by in police-involved shootings. Justified, unjustified, armed, unarmed, all of the above. But just for point of argument, let's assume that all roughly 100 of those per year involve people uh, who are killed by the police in uh, unjustified settings who are armed, and unarmed rather, and the, the cops just did all wrong. Now let's compare those 100 or so black people per year killed by the police. And again, let's assume they're all justified. Uh, unjustified killings, rather, uh, that hundred, to those who are killed by other black people. That's about 5,000 per year, about 5,000 per year. Now, if black lives matter, and I do believe black lives matter, and police shootings, police involved shootings equal at most 2% of black and black homicides, why is it racist to, dis to, to, to discuss the other 98%? Do we not owe it to the murdered victims of black on black homicides to discuss the problem and figure it out figure out how to reduce this sky-high level of killings. And people who bring it up should be able to do so without being, being yelled at as racist and being told that they should be quiet. So in conclusion, I propose that we go in a, different, in a direction exactly opposite what former Attorney General Eric Holder suggested. It's time to take a break from the national conversation on race. Let's look at culture for a while. For example, family size, family formation. What impact does that have on people's behavior, people's circumstances, where people find themselves today, where people are headed tomorrow, where people were yesterday? Let's look at the economy and how economic growth and increasing prosperity can ease racial tensions and make, better, better, make things better for everybody across the country. We're growing right now at 0.95% per annum. Very, very weak rate of economic growth. I think of this economy, we're growing better, and more people had more, more jobs, more incomes, and they could pay their bills more easily. That wouldn't get rid of racism altogether, but a lot of what brings out tensions in people is having trouble paying their bills and taking care of themselves and their loved ones, and that usually, or very often, leads to, I'm in trouble because of the white people, the black people, the gay people, the Jews, the Catholics, whoever else it is, the other, and the finger pointing begins when people have, or can be exacerbated when people have those sorts of economic problems. Let's restore our sense of humor. That's not funny is a great way to shut down dialogue. I think that if we engaged in these things with more of a sense of goodwill and more of a sense of good humor, I think we'd find a lot more capacity for uh, 
uh, dialogue and for uh, consensus, consensus then division and dissensus. And finally, let's not assume each other's ill will. The term implicit bias assumes as step one that the other guy or gal is deep down a racist or is filled with some sort of with racial animus of one kind or another. It's up to the other person, the, the burden of proof is on the other person to prove that that person is not racist, not biased. Instead, let's assume this. Why don't we try implicit decency? The other guy or gal is deep down a human being of goodwill, and it's up to us to prove otherwise. That's not going to be true every time, but what if instead of assuming everybody else deep down is a racist, we assume deep down everyone else is somebody of goodwill, who at least is trying to do the right thing, and maybe we can help these people understand certain words feel better than others, and certain circumstances are good to remember and be aware of, but not assume deep down everybody's a racist who's out to get us. I think that's an unfortunate way to go through life. As the saying goes, when you hold a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Likewise, when you always look for racism, everyone looks like a racist. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, for these, these reasons and more, the time is now to give our hammers a rest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for three wonderful talks. Um, So I want to, it's, it's funny because there's, there's no silence and right now and silence is a, is, is a lot, I think, of what was just spoken about. Um, I want to I try and draw together um, some of the, what I hear to be very divergent um, arguments or understandings about the way that we encounter one another and the way that we think about difficult conversations and what, what it is we're doing here, trying to have these difficult conversations. Um, so it's a, question, it's a question of language. Um, so I'm gonna kind of work backwards. Deroy, when you were giving the, the, the examples, the humorous examples of the, of the pumpkin spice lattes and the Mexican sombreros, you were, it, it sounded like you were describing a don't ask, don't tell policy that we kind of adopt towards one another out of this demand for political correctness um, because we're afraid of um, offending one another. And so I think there's a question there of what can be said, what should be said, what, we're, what we consciously or unconsciously say to one another, and this, this assumption of not knowing if you're offending one another. Um, and maybe a question of whether or not we should be offending one another, or not consistently checking in to make sure what we're saying is meeting some, some degree of political correctness. And when we think about having difficult conversations, and this kept popping up in my mind, I hadn't actually thought about the phrase difficult conversations. When I hear that phrase, conversations, I, I think of a dialogue. I think, okay, we're here together in this room. You and I are going to talk, right? And I assume that there's that kind of ground there, and that ground is embedded in the idea of conversation um, itself. We imagine that we're having a dialogue. But what I hear, um, what I hear Chris and Erica suggesting is that instead of a dialogue, a back and forth, that what we actually need is to create spaces not for difficult conversations, but for difficult listening, or I think what Erica called deep listening, um, that we need silence and we need to learn how to become better listeners of one another. And I think that also ties back to DeRoy's point about not assuming the worst um, when people are talking to us. And then Chris, you said that, I'm gonna quote you, you said, the attempt to find common ground is a way of shielding us from the hard work of thinking. And I'm wondering if that 
establishes the space of mutual respect that we need to listen um, to one another. This, this idea of respect that Erica and I think Deroy were, were calling our a- attention to. How much, how much generosity do we give one another in our daily interactions? Um, and so maybe instead of finding common ground, should we be acknowledging uncommon ground? And I'll leave it there. We'll start there. So, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Baldwinian, um, and one thing that was one of the things that's remarkable about James Baldwin is that he, he really believed in the uses of love for a healthy democracy. But Baldwin's love was not about unconditional love. It was about the love we, we want to show people in a filial sense as brothers and sisters rather than either an erotic sense or a disinterested sense, right? Um, but that kind of love, what's important about the idea of love, for example, is that it's not just given and it's not just taken. Love is always a proper love that endures. It's one in which people, one, make themselves vulnerable, right? And so when I say something like, um, try, you know, the rush to find common ground, the reason why I, I, I give that a bit of side eye is because usually the rush to, com- to find common ground is not sincere. It's really a way of avoiding making oneself vulnerable. But if you don't make yourself vulnerable, then there's really no opportunity for me to love you in the proper way that I ought to love you. And if I can't show you that love, then it's not gonna be immediately apparent how you will show it back to me. And in some ways, your rush to common ground makes us, renders us more strangers than not. And so I have to put that out there because the idea of common ground seems to intuitively say, well, we find common ground then, but it's the rush to find common ground then missing, right? Missing the mark. Can I ask who the you is? That you, you, you're saying you and your, and your rush to common ground. Who is the you right. so, that mo- you're... I mean, in, people, in, interlocutors, um, it, you know, mostly when I, when, I, when I speak with, let's say, um, you know, fellow white colleagues um, in the profession, um, you know, like the example I gave, you know, you, you try to convey a story of this respect that is unmistakably based on how you woke up in the morning and the skin you have, and then there's a there's a narrative offer that actually is not in any way commensurate. And it's that rush to, oh, I have a story just like yours. Mm-hmm. That if you actually just said, well, that's really messed up, let me think about that. You actually render yourself vulnerable because you can't help but think, have, have, have I ever done something like that before? But the rush to offer a story completely actually negates the opportunity for you to actually be reflective and say, well, where am I in this story, right? Just because I'm not referenced it doesn't mean I'm not in it somehow. On my microphone. There we go. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll give a couple examples of this. One is, again, going back to the idea that we do have common humanity among us, most of us anyway. We're all here. We're all in this country. Whether we like it or not, some of us came to this country of our free will, or our ancestors did. Uh, ancestors did. Some of us were brought here against our ancestors' will. But nonetheless, here we are in the United States of America, all 325 million of us. We have to figure out some way of living here together. Otherwise, it's going to be bedlam and chaos, which I don't think anybody wants. Or at least I hope not. And so one thing I think is important to do is not always necessarily drop the R word first, the R word being racist. So, for example, um, again, I come out of the world of political commentary. That's most of what I do. And um, you always hear comments, oh, well, you know, the only reason that people ever vote against anything Obama wants is because it's racism. They just don't like the guy. Republicans hate the guy. They're racist. That's why they oppose him. Then I look back at something just about maybe two, three weeks ago, he had his first veto overridden. This was on the question of could Americans uh, sue Saudi Arabia because of Saudi uh, involvement in the September 11th massacre. And uh, first time Obama was overridden, I think he, I think the vote was 97 to 1 in the Senate. I forget the House vote, but it was also overwhelming. Now, that involved a lot of Democrats who voted against Obama. Now, are those Democrats racists who don't like Obama? Is that, is that how that works? So maybe we ought to think about something else. Maybe people oppose Obama, Obama's legislative agenda, not because he's black, but because they disagree with his views. They have a different philosophy, a different set of public policy principles. And yet so often you turn on the TV and hear instantly, oh, Republicans just hate Obama's guts because he's black, and therefore they're, they're opposed to Obamacare, opposed to his tax or spending proposals, what have you. 
There are times, yes, it's appropriate to drop the R word when somebody says or does something racist, but I don't think it's always necessarily a good, a good idea to, to lob that grenade first, which I think we do too much in the society. Uh, the other thing, this is an example of a, I gave a speech back in Texas about, oh, this must be 15 years ago, I guess, or something like that. And after I got done with the speech, this very nice middle-aged white woman came up to me, and it was a speech about economics and school choice and a lot of other things. And she said to me, um, can you tell me a little bit about what sort of uh, obstacles you overcame to be here today? And I said, well, like, the biggest obstacles, obstacles I had were basically having a loving mother and father who made me do my homework instead of go out and play. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to, have, to be, have two parents who are happily married now and have been for 56 years, I think is the amount of time, and um, grew up in a middle-class home, not an upper-middle-class home, but they both worked. We had a decent amount of money. My dad was a computer systems analyst at Kaiser Hospitals and a computer programmer before that. My mother was a teacher at the L.A. school. I'm from Los Angeles originally. With the L.A. school district for about 23, 24 years or something like that. Now, I could have said, I can't believe what a racist you are. You assume that just because I'm black, I came up from, from uh, you know, difficulty and dad in prison, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't, I didn't take that. I assumed that this woman went, meant well when she thought that I came from a rough background. I told her what my background was like, which wasn't, frankly, all that terribly rough at all. I was, you know, not a wealthy neighborhood growing up in Los Angeles, but it was, uh, I'd say, middle class. And uh, I could have been offended by that question, but I wasn't. I just told her the answer to the question and assumed that she asked it in goodwill and wasn't uh, uh, asking it or presenting that in any kind of a hostile fashion. So I think trying, to, trying not to, to bring out the R word and that form of thinking as, as quickly as we do these days probably would do, go a lot further to uh, increasing uh, peace in the valley, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. Um, is this on? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I want to go back to the stories that we tell each other, that we tell ourselves, that people assume about us when they see us, and how we can slow down uh, the speed with which we make assumptions about the other person, okay. which I think is what you were describing, but also slowing down um, enough to actually have a real conversation. So I noticed that I introduced this idea of difficult conversations because the name of the conference is Difficult Questions. <coughs> difficult conversations means that we're going to actually be intentional about creating a dialogic space, which this conference I hope will be. Uh, Chris brought out that actually it's kind of one way, but hopefully you create not just difficult questions that somebody raises abstractly. These are interesting questions. No. <laughs> but actually, what are the conditions for having the conversation? And that conversation takes intention, preparation, ground rules, all those things that liberal arts colleges like Bard did not have to think about 10 years ago quite so hard. Because these are much more diverse spaces. And that's partially why we feel like, why, are, why does it, this discourse seem on fire right now? It's on fire because this world is changing. The world of higher education is changing. The world is changing. We're, you know, so one of the things I didn't say is there's a certain urgency to, this converse, to having conversations right now because <laughs> the consequences of our action as a world superpower are readily coming home to roost all the time. Everything we do as a superpower, U.S., right? All the things we do coming home to, rest, to roost. The, the demographics of the country is changing. Climate change is changing how we can interact with other countries. Our consumption of oil and resources makes other countries unstable and it drives people, immigration, right, back to you know, the de you know, the developed countries. So all of that is, I, I, I don't want to be too extensive, but I do think there's a certain urgency and there's a reason why the flame seems to be high and why it is so urgent for us to learn how to have conversation and to hold dialogic space with each other so that we can listen, truly listen. I, I want to ask a, yep. Okay. Um. Let's start over here with this young lady, and then Ethan over here on the right. Willem, thanks. Um, hi. So 
This is something that honestly stands out to me since I have read, um, I think, Chris, I think I read your piece already, on, um, in the New York Times, Race, Truth, and Our Two Realities. So one thing that I guess we're all speaking on is the idea of having conversations. And what really stood out to me was, Mr. Murdoch, you said that we should take a break from having conversations. And then you went to quote how you disagree with Eric Holder, who said, we, have, we don't have enough conversations nationally when it comes to dealing with race. And in a sense, I think I more so agree with him on that. It's like we have conversations, but we brush aside certain things. So when we brush aside these things, it leads to lack of like, different people being able to converse about issues. Now, one thing that really stood out to me also is that in Race, Truth, and Our Two Realities, um, Mr. Lebrun, you said, you gave an example of basically, if you had a conversation with a man or like another person, most likely of a white race, and you said, so I say in America, black lives don't matter. You say this is false. I respond implicitly invoking the correspondence theory of truth. Just look at the rate at which blacks are killed by the police and the rate at which police officers are exculpated. You respond with a number of points. The justice system works. Black kills one another at tragic rates. Now, this is interesting to me specifically because it's statistically proven that black on black crime is 93%, but it's also statistically proven that white on white crime is 87%. So, in our community, an A minus is a 93%, but a B plus is an 87%. And it's naturally shown that when there are black on black crime, it's from communities that are predominantly black, similarly to white on white crime which are communities that are predominantly white. Hence why those two races often have crime within each other. So what Thank really you. my main question is, why do you guys think, or if you disagree, why do you think people often bring up black on black crime similar to what Mr. Murdoch did in the aspect of discussing racial issues instead of, do you think, for me I think it might have been as a means of lack of accountability or so as a method of avoidance in our country of the fact that racial inequality does exist and social injustice does exist. So I just want to know Thank your you. opinions. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Is that a question for me or for all of us? Yeah. Okay. I think all right, I'll, I'll start. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's assume we had a magic wand and we could eliminate entirely the, the, the problem that Black Lives Matter has focused on, uh, and that is unarmed black people being killed by, armed, by the armed police. And that stopped. Just and the problem went away. Uh, you'd still have about 5,000 black people being killed by other black people. And those lives matter too. I've never said black lives matter should shut up or that we shouldn't talk about this. I've said all along in my articles on radio, on television, and fora like this, that yes, this is a problem. We do need to focus on it. But can we please spend some of our time, not 100% of our time, not 90, not 80, but some of our time focusing on what do we do about things like a place like Chicago, which has seen, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's a thousand shootings this, uh, this year. You've had all these very sad stories of these little kids, seven, eight, nine years old, walking down the street getting hit by random gunfire. Uh, sometimes, uh, this is another case, not in Chicago, it was in another, I forget which city. Some little boy was literally uh, sitting at home doing his homework, doing what he's supposed to do, sitting down, sitting down, doing his homework at the kitchen table while his mom made dinner. In comes a random bullet, goes through his head, and the poor little boy is dead at age seven or eight. And there's another case, I think it was in Chicago, of a little girl who's sitting on her mom's bed doing her homework. She, had again, had a random bullet, bullet come through the, through the uh, window. She's now dead, etc. We need to focus on this. I don't know if that's a result of racism or class or gender or what it is, but we have a problem in this country, which is black people being killed by other black people. Yes, white people kill other white people. That's a problem. I'm not saying we need to ignore what Black Lives Matter talks about. Yeah, that is a very important problem, but we seem to be, we seem to put lots and lots of attention on that, a whole lot less about the problem of black and black crime, which kills 50 times as many people as, at least 50 times as many uh, people as we're seeing killed in the issue of police-involved shootings. And again, that's assuming that all the police-involved shootings are unjustified. Some of them are justified where the cops kill a black person who's got a gun and is engaged in a crime. And he w points it at the cops and the cops kill him. That's very sad when that happens, but that's called justifiable uh, police involvement. But even if you assume that they're all unjustified, the problem of black and black crime is 50 times larger and all I'm saying is, let's spend some of our time talking about it rather than about none of our time talking about it, which is what we do in the society today. Did you want to? Um, I was on, um, thank you very much for your question. I was on um, Chicago um, AM radio about three weeks ago, um, and uh, there was a conservative 
talk show host. And, you know, these arguments, honestly, they are, they are, they are really boring um, because it's always the same thing. You know, it must be the black family. Oh, but look, you know, black people shoot each other like really no shit. People like black people shoot each other like we know this, right? Um, but, 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 but let's take the question seriously. But let's take it really seriously. So the gentleman asks me, so I, you know, tell him about why black lives matter versus all lives matter and why it's disingenuous and surprise, surprise. Well, what about right here in Chicago, black people are killing each other at tragic rates? A number of things being said. One, yes, that's tragic. Two, don't act like there aren't actually groups actually speaking about that. There are just different conversations happening. People who are asking about what about black and black, there actually are conversations about that. So it's not as if there was a black meeting and everyone said, let's focus on the police. Like, that's not what happens, right? <laughs> like, that's not what happens. Um, but then number three, because he said, and should being how many more bodies are black taken from each other, shouldn't that be a priority? I said, listen, you must speak about numbers. Let's talk about the millions of black bodies that have been oppressed and decimated over 300 years. Now we can talk about priority, right? And so, and so, and so, and, but that, that, none of that to say that black people should kill each other, no one should pay attention. It's just that two things happening. One thing is that com people think that conversation isn't happening, and it is happening. The conversation that was not happening, that black people have been trying to get on national stage forever, was police abuse. So finally we got on, on the agenda, and everyone wants to act like no one ever talked about any other kind of crime. So that's that. But then the other case where people say, what about black people shooting each other? It's also, not all the time, but sometimes, and I'm not saying it's the case in DeRoy's case, but I'm saying sometimes, it's also a very, very sly way of saying, well, if you think the cops are violent, look at those black people. And they're really violent. And, 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 that's all, and that's really all that's about. They actually don't care that black people are killing each other. What all they really want to do is get out of the idea that their precious state institution that keeps their suburbs safe could also be a murderous institution that, that basically terrorizes black people across the country. They don't want to face that fact, so they talk about black people killing yeah. each other. And again, that is tragic, but it's not like that conversation isn't happening. So we shouldn't be disingenuous about that point. Yeah, uh, can I just add a couple of other things, which is that it's the same Chicago Police Department that was found to be framing people and fabricating evidence, right? And putting people in jail um, for severe sentences in collusion, right? With the uh, district attorneys. So let's talk about the level of trust or distrust or lack of trust that people have in the police department. It's, you know, Black, Movement for Black Lives is not just about police abuse, it's about a system, right, of criminal justice and of law enforcement and the way that they behave like an occupying force in some communities. So nobody trusts them. So even if you do see something, are you gonna say something to them? Because every time you call them, they shoot everybody up. So it's, it's, they're another gang. You know, there's this gang, there's that gang, and there's the police gang. So um, it's, it, 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 there's, this is a systemic, issue, not just individual police officers, but actually a system that actually works towards its purpose, right? Which is to um, contain um, and, it, you know, to contain and imprison black bodies and to make sure that there are certain behaviors, right, that will um, make others feel safe. So, um, yeah, it's, it's complicated, and that's not a paraphrase. You can say black on black crime, but actually that conceals a whole web of um, you know, contracts, agreements, and uh, control. So we're gonna take just um, one more question. So I think I saw your hand first. So Ethan, and then this gentleman here in the black jacket with the white stripe, and we'll take the questions together. Um, my question is primarily for Mr. LeBron, but I would also like to hear uh, Ms. Hunt and Mr. Murdoch's opinion as well. Um, as someone uh, who is white, when I talk about certain issues with other people, such as particularly uh, gender, sexuality, and race, a common reply is that um, there's something that I just don't get. And that in order to get this, I need to listen to other people, specifically people who have certain identities. And this for me is very confusing. Um, because I'm often wondering, which people should I talk to? If the question is about race, some people will say, you need to listen to black people. And then I'm left wondering, which black people should I speak with? 
because I could speak with uh, some black people who would uh, say one thing, some black people would say another thing, conservative, liberal. So I almost feel as if in this act of choosing who to listen to, I could self-select who I would listen to in order to get the answer that I want, um, which would then create more problems. So um, I'm just wondering how you would suggest one goes about listening to a certain group of people in order to gain a certain kind of knowledge. Thank you. Yes. I mean, it's a fantastic question. Just, I mean, what, just, we're going to take the two questions okay. together. No, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, what I wrote down what I wanted to say. Okay. What I wanted to ask you is that this event is all about having a conversation about difficult questions regarding sex, religion, and race. But um, each panel has been significantly lacking in diversity, uh, disregarding the moderators. The first panel was three college-educated white women. Um, then the next one was two white men. And then the third one is three black people. The, the lack of um, Asians, Latin Americans, people who identify as LGBTQ is, uh, is frankly startling. It's um, easy to have a dialogue with people uh, of your same opinions and situations, but like, as fellow people of um, color and, and minorities, like, what are your opinions of the lack of diversity in these discussions? Thank you. <coughs> Chris? So I'll just I'll address, so the question about which, um, which black people you speak to. Um, <laughs> so, I, 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 to, I, totally, I totally hear you. Um, first of all, before people, I have no idea, so bef when people say, oh, you don't get it, the, there's two things actually DeRoy and I can't agree on, and that is no one should jump to conclusions about another person's character just because of how they look. So, I mean, we definitely can agree on, on that. And so when people tell you you just don't get it, I don't know what the context for that is. Those people really well could be wrong, right? I mean, so they could be wrong. And that's just because a black person says it doesn't make them right. So that's that. Um, but let, let's assume, let's actually imagine for a second, the person is absolutely right that something we, right, we're, not, like, we're not getting, right? Um, there is no which ones do I listen to? Being part of how this, these conversations go, you know, Eric was about decompartmentalizing the idea of black on black crime. The idea of getting it is not about, oh, I get the rest of the world and I just don't get what's going on with race. Actually, the, the really complex thing about race is that the kind of moral, ethical skills you need to be able to speak about race intelligently, they're not walled off from the kind of moral, ethical skills you need to live a good life otherwise, right? So part of it is not even a matter of, oh, like, I've got everything else down, let me just go find the right rap records and we're good. Like, it's not, that's right, that's not how that's gonna work, right? I'm not trying to be funny. That's not how it's gonna work, right? So really, the idea is not about which black people to speak to, it's about, well, really, what's my understanding of what it means to take on different perspective, for example, right? And it's not, there's never only just one perspective. And look, the same thing, you know, nothing Baldwin said, like, blacks are criminals and scoundrels and rapists and, you know, everything else as well. That's why we're just as human as everybody else. It's, it's not a matter of, oh, which black folks to listen to. It's just a matter of, hmm, there's a person that I can listen to that seems to be insightful. Let me start there. Then I'll, then I'll incorporate that knowledge in a conversation. Then my knowledge will be amended. This is how we learn all things, right? But it's a matter of being able to, in some sense, right, take that leap. So, and very quick to this question, but I'll, I'll let everyone else address it. Sometimes, especially with a conference like this, and I can sympathize because I've been on, on the other side of it, it's not always as simple as, well, why don't you just have more people? I'll give you an example. There are, in the academy, in the top 20 universities, there are maybe five black philosophers. It's about out of 400 philosophers across the... So what that means is that when there's anything on race, five of us are on call. We're like... A, like <laughs> yeah. You should see. I wish I'd, I wish I... I, I wish I had, exactly, I wish I, had, I wish I had a frequent flyer, but I'm not sure why I don't, right? And so what winds up happening, I'm being very serious, is that these issues are live now, and the academy and certain professions are, tra are trailing in the resources they have to offer up for these conversations. That doesn't mean that people shouldn't try hard to have representation, but sometimes it genuinely is more difficult than it looks, and I've seen it trying to organize things. You want to have the right voices, but so-and-so is already committed to three or four other things. 
things, right? Um, and so I'm not saying that's an excuse. I'm just saying that that's the other side of what happens sometimes, which doesn't mean you shouldn't try to hold these events accountable. You should always ask your question. I'm just trying to put that out there as it, is, it isn't always, oh, these people must have not been, they must have been asleep at the wheel. It isn't always that way. Sometimes the people just really aren't there because of how much certain professions are trailing in representation. So I just want to put that out there. That's all. I want to thank, thank, Chris, thank Chris for trying to, I want to thank Chris for trying to save me in Erica's terminology. Um, and, 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 but let me, and I want to address the question because it's come up twice. Um, we have really made an effort. Uh, six people withdrew from the conference that were supposed to come. It's hard to plan these things in advance. Um, and uh, we have, you know, I think we do have a, f a good conversation with a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives. I hope that shows itself over two days. Um, but it, it, does, it is hard to plan these things. And, and um, I'm, I'm the one responsible. And um, I'm happy to take that, uh, to t t take the questions and the comments. They take, I take them very seriously. And, uh, and we're trying to do the best we can, and we'll try and do better. So thank you very much. May, may I make a comment on this? And uh, let's, Doroy and Erica, respond quickly. Yes. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I would make a couple comments to the first gentleman's question. Uh, talk to as many people as you can and ask them to listen as well to be speaking and listening both directions. Uh, as for the question of diversity on, on this panel, I, first of all, I was chuckling a lot, um, it's hurting my lungs even further, uh, about Chris saying that he's one of, one of five people uh, in his field who are often called upon uh, to speak out on this, and that you guys are like a, the fire department running from one conference to the next, and so on and so forth. Uh, I happen to be a black conservative, as we're called, black Republican, whatever term you want to use. And there are about five or six of us, and we run from one TV studio to one <laughs> conference to another event, and so we have our own fire department in that regard. Uh, which gets to the point of here, of, of this panel, uh, we have a, a white moderator, three black folks up here. Uh, and therefore, yeah, no, no diversity, as you can see, but actually there is quite a bit of diversity. You have a, a poet, a professor, a political commenter. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles originally, so you have somebody from the West Coast. I don't know if you guys are from the West Coast or elsewhere. I happen to be a gay man, so you've got that, uh, that sexual, sexuality uh, diversity as well. So just because we look the same doesn't mean we are the same. The diversity can, can be much deeper than you look. Um, <clears throat> And, it, and, it, and also, as you may have gathered, the things I said didn't necessarily comport completely with what they said. So you had diversity uh, in terms of uh, idea, ideas and principles as well. So there's a lot more diversity up here than you would see just if you took a snapshot and showed it, handed it to somebody. Erica? Um, we have a 300-year history of um, white supremacist thinking, I think, in this country. Um, and it didn't happen overnight. So getting through it will be hard work. It's hard work. You got to know a lot of different people. You have to be brave. You got to be curious. You got to be curious about other people. You got to get out of your comfort zone. There's no right black people or right Latino people or right gay people. What, what, you know, there are people and, and uh, you got to be willing to hear things that, you know, may surprise you about the person you're speaking to and their background and their experiences. And as Chris said, don't rush to make the common ground when in fact, uh, don't rush to make the common ground. The ground is shifting. <laughs> the ground is shifting under our feet and people and how they, uh, how they think about themselves. Even Mary Gatskill's story this morning about how her story shifted as time shifted and her understanding grew. I think we have to really, as hard as that might be, just be willing to put in that time, the difficulty of a difficult conversation is just work, labor. I think that's the perfect note to end on. Please thank, please join me in thanking our panel.